There are many times while creating a game where you will want to perform an action multiple times. Let's say, for example, each time a player joins our game, we want to announce this to every other player. Since we want to perform the same action for every single player in our game, we would use a loop. Now, there are multiple different types of loops that we can use, but there are a few fundamentals that they all share. The actual process of a loop repeating is called an iteration. So each time a loop, well, loops, this is a single iteration. So if we had a loop which ran five times, that means that that loop would iterate five times. Now the first loop that we'll be covering today is the while loop. Now looking at the code that I wrote on screen, we can see that first we use the keyword while. After that we have a red underlined word called condition. And then after that underlined word we have the word do. And then we can see that we have our code block here and then an end statement on the fifth line. Now the reason that the word condition is underlined in red is because we did not actually put a condition inside of our while loop. Now the while loop is quite basic and it will repeat itself until the condition that we specified is no longer met. Now the word condition is underlined in red because this is not an actual valid condition. Now we actually learned about conditional statements, so we can easily add a condition by saying something like five is greater than one. So the actual condition of this while loop is that the number five is greater than the number one. And since that condition is true, this while loop will repeat all of the code that's inside of its code block until this condition is no longer true. And considering five can never be a lower number than one, this while loop will run infinitely. Now let's go ahead and insert some code inside of the code block so we'll use the print function and we'll just print the word yes so now if we were to use this while loop this while loop is actually going to run unlimitedly and it will never stop running because like i said five can never be less than the number one now let's say for example that we only want this while loop to run five times well above our while loop what we can actually do is create a variable called count and we can set the value of that to the number zero then what we could do is inside of our while loop every single time the while loop iterates we can increase the value of count by one and now let's update the condition of our while loop and let's say that we want this to repeat while the count variable is less than the number five so now this while loop would run five times because every single time we're adding one to the count variable now while loops are pretty simple which is why we're covering these first but also in my opinion these are used a whole lot less than our other type now the other type of loops that we're going to be talking about are for loops now on screen we can see two for loops the first for loop is to help break down the actual anatomy of a for loop while the second one is used to give you a visualization of what using an actual for loop looks like so in order to create a for loop, the first thing that we actually do is create a variable. And to create a variable, all we do is we actually put the name of the variable that we're creating right here. Normally, we name this variable i as that's short for the word index. We then use an equal sign to set the value of that variable. And the value that we'll set would actually be the start value for where this for loop actually begins at. So here, we start the for loop at the number one. After that, we use a comma, and then we specify the end value. Now, the end value is what i actually has to reach for this for loop to stop. After that, we then use another comma and then we specify the increase value. The increase value right here is one. And what this value is, is how much the value of I is increased every single iteration. So this for loop would run a total of five times. It would begin at the number one and each iteration, the value of I would increase by one. Once we've reached and gone through the fifth iteration of this for loop, it'll end because it's reached its end value. Now, if we wanted this loop to run 10 times, we can increase the end value to 10, leaving all the other values the same. Now, what if we only wanted this to run two times? We could set the start value to five. We can set the end value to 10, and then we could set the increase value to five as well. So this would only run two times. The first time I would be five, and the second time I would be 10 because five plus five equals 10. So this would only run two times. Now, these for loops do come in handy, but they are a little bit less common than the other for loops that we actually use. Now, probably the best part about for loops is that we can actually use these to iterate over tables. This is the extremely common way of using for loops. One example of where you'd use this is again, if you wanted to perform an action on every player in your game. We would get a table containing every player in the game, and then we would use a special for loop to iterate through all of the players and perform an action on each of them. Now, first we'll talk about how to iterate over arrays. We can see right here that I've created a player's variable, which is equal to an array that contains some strings. If we then look at our for loop, we can actually see that this for loop is structured differently than the previous for loop that we created. In this for loop, these first two variables have no effect on the amount of iterations the for loop goes through. The amount of iterations is actually based on how many values are stored inside of the array. Now, these first two variables that we include while creating the for loop are again able to be used inside of the code block of the for loop itself. So we can see here that I included a print statement and I'm printing out the index along with the value as well. Now, if we were to actually run the script right here, this is what and how things would be printed out. So the first iteration would print out one for the index 
and then monster as the string. During the second iteration, we would print out two and monster four would be printed out. And then during the final and third iteration, three would be printed out for the index and then monster 99 for the string. Now, considering we learned about tables and more specifically arrays in the last episode, we know that arrays hold data in a very specific order. And the position each value is stored at is referred to as index. So when we iterate over an array, we go through all the values and with each iteration, we're given the index and the value at that specific iteration and in this specific order as well. Keep that in mind because arrays are in a specific order and the for loop respects that. Now, when it comes to iterating over dictionaries, unlike when you iterate through an array, the order is entirely random for dictionaries. Additionally, instead of getting an index for each iteration, we actually get the key. So we can see right here that I created a dictionary called settings. Inside of here, I added some key value pairs. Now, the way that we actually create a for loop is the exact same way that we do for an array. The main difference right here is the actual naming of the variables. Since we're looping through a dictionary, we know that everything is stored in a key value pair. So as we iterate through the dictionary, we get back the key and the value. Now, if we were to actually use this for loop and each time we printed something out, this is what the result could possibly look like. Remember, dictionaries have no particular order. So when we iterate over them, the order that things are printed out can be entirely random. For example, if I was to use this for loop once, we could possibly see sound effects be printed out first along with its value. Then we might see the key key as well as the value string. Then we might see the play music key along with its value, which is true. Or it could be an entirely different order. You, you really never know with dictionaries. Also, to give you a little bit more information about naming your variables in a for loop, you don't usually call them key and value. Let's say, for instance, that my settings dictionary actually only had to do entirely with settings. Now, this time when I loop through the settings dictionary, I'll actually call the first variable, which would be the key, setting, because all the keys in this dictionary now are actually a setting string. And we might want to use these in GUIs or other things like that. Now, we still call the value 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 because currently how the settings dictionary is set up is that the value of each key is a boolean referring to if that setting is toggled on or off. Now, occasionally you might find yourself using for loops to look for a specific player. Once you've found that player, you then might want to stop the for loop and run some code on that player. That's just one example of why you might want to stop mid iteration during a loop, but there's many other cases as well. So let's look at an example of where we would break during an iteration. Right here, we can see that I create a player's variable, which is equal to an array that contains a couple of strings. We're then using a for loop to iterate through that array and the first thing that we do during each iteration is print the word test after that we then use an if statement to create a conditional and what we're doing is we're checking if the value variable is equal to the string which displays monster 2 now if that condition is true then what we're going to do is print the word found and then we have the keyword break right here and now whenever the keyword break is used what that means is that the for loop stops its iterations right there and no other code after that is ran as well as no more iterations are ran neither so we can see an example of what this would look like if this for loop actually did go through, test would be printed one time. And since the first value in this array is actually monster and not monster two, nothing else will be printed. Then after that, the for loop will go again, this time at the second index. Once again, the first thing that it'll do is print test. Then after it prints test, this conditional statement right here is going to run. And since the second value inside of this array is monster two, which is the same string that we're looking for, found is going to be print. And then nothing after that is going to happen. Like I said, the reason that nothing after that's going to happen is because of the keyword break right here. Break basically tells the for loop to stop running entirely. Now, break isn't the only keyword that does this. You can also use the keyword return to do this as well. Now, here's another example of where breaking iteration might come in handy. Let's say, for instance, that we created a function called is special player. This function has one parameter called player name, and then we use a for loop to iterate through the player's array. Each time we iterate through, we're still printing the keyword test. But this time, though, we have a conditional statement. And what we're doing is we're checking if the value equals the player name that was passed to this function. Now, if that condition is true, then we're again going to print the word found, but this time we're also going to return a value, which is true. We use the print function, and then we actually call this is special player function, and we're checking if the string monster2 is a special player. So now, if this function was actually ran, once again, test would be printed once, then it would be printed again. Now, this time, since the condition is actually true, found would be printed, and then this print statement right here would print true, because that's the value that is returned from this function, and nothing else would happen, because remember, whenever the keyword return or break is actually used, that for loop stops all iterations. Now, if we look at the function once again, we can see that we made one small change, and that is this condition right here. Right here, what we're doing is we're checking if the value is equal to this string right here, and the code that we actually run is just this continue keyword right here. So once again, if this function was actually used, this is what the output would look like. The first iteration of this loop, test will not actually be printed because this condition is true, and when the continue keyword is used, what this tells the for loop to do is not execute any of the 
code down here and instantly go to the next iteration, which would be Monster 2. So now that we're iterating over Monster 2, test is being printed, found is being printed, and then finally true is being printed as well. Now I'm not going to go too in depth with continue, but just know that this is how it can be used. It'll probably be a little while before you actually start using the continue statement inside of your for loops. Its usage is a lot more niche than say something like return or break. And with that being said, you should now have a fair understanding of a couple of different loops that we can use as well as how to iterate through tables. As usual, if you have any questions, you can leave a comment down below or feel free to join our discord and ask your question in there. In the next episode, we'll begin talking about module scripts, which allow us to share code between multiple different scripts. And with that being said, I'll see you guys in the next episode.